The NRA, it's one of the most powerful lobby groups in the United States, and before it fought against gun control, it actually supported it for almost 100 years. So how did the NRA go from supporting gun regulation to... From my cold, dead hands. Hey guys, this is Sana, and this Sunday on AJ Plus, we're gonna look at the history of the NRA and gun control in the United States. And Lee Fang from The Intercept will be joining me to discuss how the NRA might be more interested in gun sales than gun rights. We know that the gun industry wields incredible influence over the NRA. The NRA likes to portray itself as simply a membership-driven organization. The NRA's uh, political advocacy and their marketing campaigns are fully integrated into the gun industry and their political agenda. The history of gun regulation in the U.S. is a history tied to racial discrimination, and the NRA was a central part of that. Founded right after the Civil War, the NRA was mostly a sports club dedicated to promoting marksmanship, but even then it had a hand in policy. In the 1920s, the NRA was part of drafting the Uniform Firearms Act, which was model gun legislation for states to adopt. The act required a license to publicly carry a gun, a license that could only be given to someone deemed suitable with proper reason. And you can guess who didn't fit those requirements. Not too long after that, the NRA endorsed the first federal gun control act, the National Firearms Act, which targeted so-called urban crime, which then was synonymous with Italian Americans. Fast forward to the civil rights era. The Black Panthers were openly and legally arming themselves in the streets of Oakland, California. Elsewhere, Malcolm X was talking about the ballot or the bullet, and of course, these famous words. And bring about the freedom of these people by any means necessary. And generally, there was growing unrest over racial inequalities. So in response to the Black Panthers who were exercising their right to armed self-defense, then governor of California, Ronald Reagan, with the support of the NRA, restricted its open carry laws with the Mulford Act of 1967. That act banned the open carrying of loaded weapons. And a year later, there was a Federal Gun Control Act of 1968. Now, the 60s had seen a slew of major political assassinations. Congress, with the support of the NRA, passed the act. It became the primary federal law regulating firearms, barring mail order sales of rifles and shotguns, and prohibiting most felons from purchasing them. But then the 70s happened and the NRA started changing its tune. At a 1977 NRA meeting in Cincinnati, a group of anti-gun control members essentially staged a coup. They put their man Harlan Carter in charge as executive vice president. And Carter had a colorful past. He was convicted of murder for shooting a Mexican teenager when he himself was a teenager. Carter served only two years. And three years after his release, he joined the U.S. Border Patrol, becoming its head in 1950. He even bragged about his all-out war against undocumented Mexicans in a 1954 interview with the LA Times. And it was that same Carter that led the NRA's evolution from supporting gun control to a newfound unconditional love for the Second Amendment. With Carter at the head of the NRA, membership tripled in the following years. And here is where it gets interesting. The NRA started lobbying Congress for years until it passed the Firearm Owners Protection Act of 1986. That act softened some of the regulations introduced in 1968's Gun Control Act, the same act that the NRA had actually supported. But the act included an amendment that further tightened the restrictions on machine guns, and a lot of NRA members weren't too impressed, and so they left. When the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act was introduced and signed into law by Bill Clinton in 1993, the NRA fought back. They were successful in their lobbying, easing some of the restrictions introduced in the bill. That wasn't enough for the NRA. After the Brady Bill was signed into law, they funded lawsuits across several states claiming that it was unconstitutional. That fight against gun regulation led to a major surge in the NRA's membership, meaning fighting gun control was good for business. But it wasn't only because of rising membership numbers. In the early 90s, Wayne LaPierre was elected as the NRA's executive vice president. Stand up and show them you're ready to fight and ready to win. And he was critical in fostering close financial ties to the gun industry. Ties so close that the NRA has been accused of acting as more of a pro-gun industry organization than how it defines itself as a civil rights organization. And the NRA ensures gun sales by spending millions of dollars lobbying Congress, but I'm gonna get to that in just a minute. 
But first, I want to explain how the gun industry in large part bankrolls the NRA, and it's really crazy how it does it. Let's start with the Golden Ring of Freedom program. It was created in 2005 by LaPierre in order to reach out to its richest members for bigger checks. And those richest members included corporate partners from the gun industry who between 2005 and 2013 donated between 19 and 60 million dollars to the organization. In addition to donations, there are a growing number of NRA programs sponsored by gun manufacturers. For example, in 2011, Sturman Rugger launched the One Million Gun Challenge, a campaign to sell one million guns with one dollar from each purchase going to the NRA. But there's more and Lee can break that down. Companies like Sturm Ruger, Smith & Wesson, uh, they actually disclose to investors that on a quarterly basis they provide millions of dollars to the NRA as part of their operating expenses. So when they're doing their own audits saying that they've got to pay for staff and other upkeep, they actually include regular contributions to the NRA. Now the NRA is putting a lot of the money that it's received, whether from gun manufacturers or membership fees, towards lobbying Congress. When gun control legislation does come to Congress, they have direct lobbyists, people who walk the halls of Congress talking to lawmakers. They have their membership base making calls to Congress and directly meeting with, with legislators. And most importantly, they also have the threat of television advertisements. When a lawmaker threatens to vote for gun control, the NRA can air tens of millions of dollars in advertisements in their district. And that scares away a lot of lawmakers from enacting meaningful gun control legislation. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. And the proof is in the gunpowder. Now, even though a large part of the NRA's revenue comes from its membership fees, it doesn't really represent the people it says it does. A 2017 Pew Research study found that among Republican gun owners, more than half of NRA members are in favor of instituting background checks for private gun sales. And that's Republicans who own guns, who say they're NRA members. Attitudes towards gun control policy are shifting in the United States. There's more and more support for background checks, limiting access to guns for people people on watch lists, uh, people with mental illnesses, and more than half of gun owners support a federal database for tracking gun sales. But it doesn't seem that the NRA has any interest in backing away from its pro-gun industry position anytime soon. So we usually only talk about gun control whenever there's a major mass shooting in the United States, but gun violence is actually way more prevalent than that. And did you guys know, by the way, about the NRA's shift in the 1970s when it went from being so pro-gun control to so unconditionally in love with the Second Amendment? Let us know in the comments and let us know what else you want us to cover when it comes to the gun control conversation in the United States. And come back next Sunday when we come at you with another great video.